Professor Joseph Mossad is a survivor. <laughs> the Oslo Agreement did not only usher in a new era of Palestinian-Israeli relations, but has had a much more lasting effect in transforming the very language through which these relations have been governed internationally and the way the Palestinian leadership viewed them. Not only was the Palestinian vocabulary of liberation, end of colonialism, resistance, fighting racism, ending Israeli violence, and theft of the land, independence, the right of return, justice, and international law, been supplanted by new terms like negotiations, agreements, compromise, pragmatism, security assurances, moderation, and recognition, all of which had been part of Israel's vocabulary before Oslo and remain as such afterwards, but also that Oslo instituted itself as the language of peace that ipso facto delegitimizes any attempt to resist it as one that supports war and dismisses all opponents of its surrender of Palestinian rights as opponents of peace. The language of surrender of rights, the language of peace, has also been part of Israel's language before and after Oslo, and is also the language of US imperial power, in which Arabs and Muslims were instructed by President Barack Obama during his speech in Cairo last June. Thus, the transformation that Oslo brought about was not only a transformation of language as such, but also of the Palestinian language and perspective through which the nature of Palestinian-Israeli relations were viewed by the Palestinian leadership and institutionalized instead the Israeli perspective and Israel's vocabulary as neutral and objective. What Oslo aimed to do, therefore, was a change in the very goal of Palestinian policies and politics from national independence from Israeli colonialism and occupation to one where Palestinians become fully dependent for their political and national survival on Israel and its sponsors in the interest of peace and the security of their occupiers. The key transformative formula of the Oslo Agreement enshrined in the Declaration of Principles of September 13, 1993 was land for peace. This detrimental formula to internationally recognized Palestinian rights remains the guiding and delimiting approach of all subsequent agreements and disagreements prejudices the entire process by presupposing that Israel has land which it would be willing to give to the Arabs and that the Arabs, seen as responsible for the state of war with Israel, can grant Israel the peace for which it allegedly has longed for decades. Placing the responsibility of the Arab-Israeli wars on the Arabs is a standard view that is never questioned in the Western media or by Western governments. The PLO concession, however, was, has finally ensured that official Palestinians and other official Arabs, too, will not question it. Despite its surface appearance as a political compromise, this formula is, in fact, a reflection of the racial views characterizing European Jewish Israelis and Palestinians and other Arabs. Whereas the Israelis are asked and are ostensibly presented as willing to negotiate about property, the recognized Western bourgeois right par excellence, Palestinians and other Arabs are asked to give up violence, or more precisely, their violent means, which is illegitimate and attributable only to uncivilized barbarians. The fact that Palestinians have already given up their rightful claim to 77% of Palestine and were negotiating about their future over a mere 23% of their homeland did not qualify as a formula of land for land on which, to, on which to base the peace process. In fact, an objective formula for any negotiations would be a land for peace formula, whereby it is Palestinians who are giving up their rightful claim to their historic homeland in exchange for an end to Israeli oppression and colonial violence against their people. The PLO, Israel, and the Western media hailed the Oslo Agreement as mutual recognition. This, however, contradicts the very words uttered by both parties and the projected actions based on these words. Whereas the PLO, which wrote the first letter, recognized the right of the State of Israel to exist in peace and security, the Israeli government, in response to that letter, written by Arafat and signed by him, has, quote, decided to recognize the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people and commence negotiations with the PLO within the Middle East peace process. But this was not mutual recognition, as the Israelis did not recognize the Palestinian people's right to exist in a state of their own in peace and security, as the PLO had done vis-a-vis -vis Israel.
Had the PLO only recognized the Rabin government as the representative of the Israeli people, without necessarily granting any right to the Israeli state to exist in peace and security or in any other way, then the PLO's recognition would have been on a par with Israel's. The actual agreement, therefore, did not amount to mutual recognition. Rather, it amounted to the legitimation of the Jewish state by the very people against whom its racist colonial policies had been and continue to be practiced, with the Israelis committing to nothing substantively new. Granting the PLO the recognition as the representative of the Palestinians, something the majority of the world except the US had recognized since the mid-1970s, committed Israel to no concessions to the Palestinian people at all. It only committed Israel to a scenario whereby, since the Israeli government was now inclined to speak to representatives of the Palestinians, it would talk to the PLO, as it now recognizes that party as the representative, whereas before it did not. This is precisely why successive Israeli governments and leaders have vacillated on whether they would grant the Palestinians the right to establish an independent Palestinian state and always refer back correctly to Oslo and subsequent agreements in which they made no such pledges. Having exacted a precious recognition for their legitimacy from their victims, the Israelis moved forward through the mechanism of the Oslo peace process to divide the Palestinians into different groupings, the majority of whom would be expelled outside the peace process. By transforming the PLO, which represented all Palestinians in the diaspora and in Israel and the occupied territories, including East Jerusalem, into the Palestinian Authority, which could only hope to represent Palestinians of the West Bank and Gaza, constituting one-third of the Palestinian people, the Oslo agreements engineered a major demographic reduction of the Palestinian people, dividing them by a factor of three, while bringing about a major demographic expansion of the Jewish population of Israel, multiplying their number by a factor of three. The insidious part of this process is how the PA, conscious of this transformation, continues to speak of the Palestinian people, which had been reduced through the Oslo Agreement, to those West Bank and Gaza Palestinians it now claims to represent. Diaspora Palestinians are simply referred to, referred to in accordance with US and Israeli parlance as refugees, and Israeli Palestinians are referred to by Israeli diktat as Israeli Arabs. In doing so, not only has the scope of the Palestinian leadership and its representative status of the whole Palestinian people been substantially reduced, but the Palestinian, themse Palestinian people themselves were diminished demographically by the PA's appropriation of the designation the Palestinian people to refer only to a mere third of Palestinians. In the meantime, the Oslo process has produced phantom agreements like the Geneva Accords, among others, which have pushed forward the Israeli claim that Palestinians must recognize Israel's right to exist not only in peace and security, but also as a Jewish state, meaning a state that is racist by law and discriminates by law and governance against non-Jewish citizens, and one that, one that encompasses not only its Jewish citizens, but Jews everywhere. This is something that has been pushed by the Clinton, Bush, and more recently, the Obama administrations. Indeed, Obama does not miss an opportunity to reiterate his administration's commitment to force the Palestinians to recognize Israel's right to be a Jewish state. While Israel has no legitimacy and is not recognized by any national body as a representative of Jews worldwide, but rather as a state of the Israeli people, who are citizens of it, the PLO and the PA are called upon to recognize Israel's jurisdiction over world Jewry. As such, the internationally recognized status of the PLO as the representative of the Palestinian people has been reduced to those one-third of the Palestinians since Oslo, while the representative status of the Israeli government has been expanded threefold as recognized by the PA's unofficial representatives in Geneva. Benjamin Netanyahu is insistent that no progress will take place in the so-called peace process unless the Palestinians officially recognize Israel's right to be a racist Jewish state. A few weeks ago, President Obama called on all Arabs from the pulpit of the United Nations to ratify this recognition officially. This has been done despite the fact that the majority of Jews living outside Israel are not Israeli citizens, nor have any bodies representing them ever endowed the Israeli state with representative powers on their behalf.
Dividing and reducing the Palestinian people demographically has gone hand in hand with a territorial reduction of Palestine itself or the parts of it that Israel is willing to negotiate over, re over redeploying its colonial occupation army around. Aside from the removal of the illegally expanded, occupied, and colonized East Jerusalem from the territories over which Israel would negotiate its redeployment, the West Bank itself has been subdivided into cantons that exclude Jewish colonial settlements and Jewish-only highways connecting them, as well as imposed nature reserves, as well as military bases and so-called closed areas. But this is not all. Israel also built the apartheid wall inside Palestinian land, effectively removing another 10% of the West Bank outside the negotiating table of its army redeployment. Another of the more important measures that the Israeli and Palestinian architects of the Oslo Agreement took in order to guarantee the structural survival of the Oslo peace process was the creation of structures, institutions, and classes that would be directly connected to it and that can survive the very collapse of the Oslo Agreement itself while preserving the process that the agreement generated. This guarantee was enshrined in law and upheld by international funding predicated on the continuation of the Oslo process, as long as the latter continued to serve Israeli and US interests, as well as the interests of the corrupt Palestinian elite who acquiesced in it. The five main classes that the architects of Oslo created to ensure that the process survives are as follows. A political class divided between those elected to serve the Oslo process, whether to the Legislative Council or the Executive Branch, essentially the position of the President of the Palestinian Authority, and those who are appointed to serve those who are elected, whether in the ministries or the presidential office. A policing class numbering in the tens of thousands whose function is to defend the Oslo process against all Palestinians who try to undermine it. It is divided into a number of security and intelligence bodies competing with one another, all vying to prove that they are most adept at neutralizing any threat to the Oslo process. Under Arafat's authority, members of this class inaugurated their services by shooting and killing 14 Palestinians they deemed enemies of the process in Gaza back in 1994, an achievement that earned them the initial respect of the Clinton administration and the Israelis who insisted then that the policing class should use more repression than it, had, than it had done in Gaza to be most effective. Their performance last summer in Jenin of killing Hamas members and unaffiliated bystanders to impress President Obama who asked the Palestinian leadership to keep their security part of the deal is the most recent example of this function. A bureaucratic class attached to the political class is the third uh, class that Oslo created. So a bureaucratic class attached to both the political class and the policing class, and that constitutes an administrative body of tens of thousands who execute the orders of those elected and appointed to serve the process. Also, there's an NGO class, which is a bureaucratic and technical class whose finances fully depend on their serving the Oslo process and ensuring its success through planning and services. Finally, there's a business class composed of expatriate Palestinian businessmen, as well as local businessmen, including especially members of the political, policing, and bureaucratic classes, whose income is derived from financial investment in the Oslo process and from profit-making profit deals that the Palestinian Authority can make possible. While the NGO class mostly does not receive money from the PA, being the beneficiary of foreign governmental and non-governmental financial largesse that is structurally connected to the Oslo process, the political, policing, and bureaucratic classes receive all their legitimate and illegitimate income from the PA directly. By linking the livelihoods of hundreds of thousands of Palestinians to the Oslo process, the architects had given them a crucial stake in its survivability even and especially if this process failed to produce any political results. For the Palestinian elite that took charge of the PA, the main task all along was to ensure that the Oslo process continued, regardless of whether it produced results or not, and that the elite remain in control of all the institutions that guarantee the survival of the process. What the elite did not anticipate was that they could lose control to Hamas a public opponent of the Oslo process that, in accordance with expectations, had boycotted the 1994 gerrymandered and Fatah-controlled elections. 
The 2006 elections, which Fatah was confident it would win, constituted an earthquake that could destroy all these structural guarantees and with them the process they were designed to protect. Hence the panic of the Americans who engineered the coup with the aid of Israel and the PA security and PA security under Mohammed Dahlan to topple the Hamas elected government, which included kidnapping its members of parliament, government ministers, and politicians, and holding them hostage in Israeli jails, burning the prime minister's office, and finally staging a violent takeover of Gaza, which backfired. All attempts since the American failed coup in Gaza have focused on perpetuating the peace process through maintenance of its structures under PA control and away from the democratically elected Hamas. Indeed, the destruction of Palestinian democracy was a necessary price to pay, insisted Israel and the Americans, and pushed forward by the military efforts of Lieutenant General Keith Dayton. This situation became possible because of the funding strategy of the US, Israel, and Arab oil producing states toward the Palestinian struggle. The story of the Palestinian national movement can only be told through the ways and means that different Arab and non-Arab governments have tried to control it. While the Palestine Liberation Organization was established and controlled principally by the regime of Gamal Abdel Nasser, in 1967, the defeat weakened that arrangement, leading to the revolutionary guerrillas' takeover of the organization in 1969. With Fatah and the leftist Palestinian guerrillas at the helm, the revolutionary potential of the PLO constituted such a threat that it precipitated an all-out war in Jordan in 1970, a situation, that was powerful and a situation that powerful and repressive Arab regimes did not want to see repeated. It is in this context that Arab oil money from Saudi Arabia, from Kuwait, the United Arab Emirates, Libya, Iraq, began to pour into the coffers of the PLO primarily to ensure that it would not encourage revolutionary change in Arab countries and that insofar as it did not compromise Arab regime interests, its weapons should only be directed towards Israel. The Lebanese civil war and the PLO role in it in the second half of the 1970s remained a problem as far as the Arab regimes were concerned, but it was a problem that they were able to contain. With the onset of the 1980s and the military defeat of the PLO in 1982 in Beirut, Arab funding for the PLO was no longer conditioned on its not turning its weapons against them only, but that the organization also no longer target Israel. The various attempts at agreements between the PLO and King Hussein in the mid-1980s were part of that plan. With continued US and Israeli refusal to deal with the PLO no matter how much its policy and ideology had changed, the situation remained frozen until the first Palestinian uprising in 1987 gave the PLO the bargaining opportunity to lay down its weapons against Israel. The formalization of this transformation took place in Algiers in 1988 and later on at the Madrid Peace Conference. As oil funding dried up after the Gulf War of 1990-91, the PLO needed new funders. Enter the US and its allies, whose terms did not only include the Oslo Agreement, but also that the newly created and Fatah-controlled Palestinian Authority be indeed armed, but that its weapons should have a new target, the Palestinian people. The PA obliged and continued to receive its funding until the Second Intifada, when contra the raison d'etre, some of its security forces did engage the Israelis in gunfire when the Israelis attacked Palestinian civilians. Funding from the US and its allies was intermittently stopped, Yasser Arafat was placed under house arrest, and the Israelis reinvaded. A resumption of steady funding continued after Arafat's death, conditional upon Mahmoud Abbas's seriousness in pointing Palestinian guns at the Palestinians themselves, which he, he and the PA's thuggish security apparatuses have done effectively. However, they have not been as effective as the US and Israel had wished which is why General Dayton is assuming full control of the military situation on the ground in order to assist the Palestinians to deliver their peace part of the bargain to Israel. Note that throughout the last 16 years, Israeli leaders have consistently spoken in line with the formula of land for peace that they want and seek peace with the Palestinians, but not the establishment of a Palestinian independent state, nor to ensure the Palestinians' right to self-determination. 
Indeed, not only has Israel multiplied the number of colonial settlements and more than doubled the Jewish colonial settler population of the West Bank and East Jerusalem, chipping away at more of the land that was set to be under negotiations, it has done so while consistently exacting more Palestinian concessions to ensure Israeli security in order for Palestinians to give Israel the peace on which the formula of land for peace is based. The Americans and the Europeans have also insisted that the Palestinians must give Israel peace before it can decide which lands to give them back and under whichever arrangement it finds most ensuring of this peace. Therefore, what land for peace, despite or because of its definitional prejudice against the Palestinian people, has brought about is a perpetual, defer perpetual deferment of the return of the land with insistent demands of advance payments on the peace the Palestinians must deliver to Israel. While the redeployment around Gaza and laying siege to its population, starving and bombarding them, is marketed as Israel's compromising by returning land, the reality remains that the Gaza Strip has been transformed from a prison policed by the Israelis into a veritable concentration camp guarded and surrounded by them from the outside with infiltration inside as the need arises, as it did last winter. Ultimately then, what the Oslo Agreement and the process it generated have achieved is a foreclosure of any real or imagined future independence of the Palestinian leadership or even national independence for one-third of the Palestinians in the West Bank and Gaza, who are at any rate the only Palestinians that the Oslo Agreement claims to want to help to achieve it. By mortgaging the Palestinian leadership to U.S. and Israeli sponsorship, by creating and maintaining administrative, legal, and financial structures that will ensure the dependence or the, their dependence, Oslo has been what it was designed to be from the start the mechanism of ending the Palestinian quest to end Israeli colonialism and occupation, and the legitimation of Israel's racist nature by the very people over whom it exercises its colonial and racist dominion. Anyone who questions these strictures can be fought with the ideological weapon of pragmatism. Opposing Oslo makes one a utopian extremist and a rejectionist, while participating in its structure makes one a pragmatist, moderate person working for peace. The most effective ideological weapon that Oslo has deployed since 1993 is precisely that anyone who opposes its full surrender of Palestinian national rights is a proponent of war and an opponent of peace. In short, the goal of the Oslo process, which has been reached with much success, is not the establishment of Palestinian independence from Israel's illegal occupation, but rather to end Palestinian independence as a future goal and as a current reality. Seen from this angle, Oslo continues to be a resounding success. He's a...